Welcome back, everybody. I wanted to give a thank you for everybody who watched my last video. It was by far the most watched video I have done to date. And I really appreciate everyone for taking the time out of their day to check it out. Thank you. After the big announcement last week, I thought things would turn out for the best and probably be okay. I also had hope, despite the evidence to the contrary, that maybe Cavill would stay in the role of Superman, a role that he's been fantastic in, and the audience would love to see him return in a more meaningful way. But then we learned that Henry Cavill was booted after announcing that he was back, back in October, I think. Let's take a look at what Cavill had said on his Instagram. I have just had a meeting with James Gunn and Peter Safran, and it's sad news, everyone. I will, after all, not be returning as Superman after being told by the studio to announce my return back in October, prior to their hire. This news isn't easy, but that's life. The changing of the guard is something that happens. I respect that. James and Peter have a universe to build. I wish them and all involved with the new universe the best of luck and the happiest of fortunes. For those who have been by my side through the years, we can mourn for a bit, but then we must remember Superman is still around. Everything he stands for still exists. And the example he sets for us are still there. My turn to wear the cape has passed, but what Superman stands for never will. It has been a fun ride with you all, onward and upwards. Ouch, that kind of hurt reading it. And no, I'm not crying, you're crying. James Gunn posted on his Twitter related to the subject. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. But we just had a great meeting with Henry and we're big fans. And we talked about a number of exciting possibilities to work together in the future. That's the end of the tweet. In this video, I'll be asking the question of who killed the DCEU. In a follow-up video, we'll break down what will happen next for the studio and the former actors of the DCEU. As to the first question, the obvious choice would be the duo of James Gunn and Peter Safran, specifically James Gunn, since he's the creative end of their partnership. James Gunn seems to be intent on a total reboot of the DCU without any of the baggage from the Snyderverse. This doesn't sit well with the DCEU fandom, and they have gone full-on nerd rage with Gunn, and they have been very vocal about the DCU co-CEO and creative director. Since news broke about Cavill being fired, the hashtag of Fire James Gunn has steadily trended on Twitter. But has Gunn torpedoed the DCEU and Snyderverse? Ultimately, he may not be solely responsible for their downfall. I bring up another player in this movie studio version of Game of Thrones, and that is former pro wrestler turned Hollywood superstar, Dwayne Johnson. An article from Deadline recently discussed the profitability of The Rock's last movie, Black Adam. Truth be told, this article was a little puzzling. It didn't appear to be an objective, fact-based analysis. It seemed like it was fed to them by Dwayne Johnson's team, who were trying to counter claims that Black Adam didn't make money. Now, this thing isn't exactly new. There were rumors that in 2014, Ryan Reynolds leaked the test he had done of Deadpool online to generate interest in the character and open the door to a possible movie adaptation. Now, of course, I'm talking beyond the version that was in X-Men Origins Wolverine. We can all forget about that, hopefully. In that case, and I don't know if he truly leaked it or not, but if he did, it worked wonderfully. The movie got its financing and it helped relaunch Reynolds' career. Even Zack Snyder himself played a big role in the Twitter phenomenon that was the hashtag of release the Snyder Cut that eventually led to the release 
of the Zack Snyder Justice League on HBO Max. Also, movie studios use creative accounting on movies all the time. This could be done for a variety of reasons, including to show that a movie is more profitable than it may be. So in a sense, what Johnson had done was kind of common practice for studios. But in this case, it really did blow up in his face. Reports indicate that Johnson and his production company, Seven Bucks Productions, wanted to have a big creative role in the DCEU before Saffron and Gunn came aboard. The Henry Cavill cameo at the end of Black Adam was more of a political move rather than a creative one. In a quote from The Hollywood Reporter claimed, in the end, he was a pawn in Dwayne's failed attempt to control a piece of DC. This makes sense since at the time Cavill's Hollywood representation was Danny Garcia, who is the ex-wife and manager of Dwayne Johnson. Now, there have been rumors that Cavill had fired Garcia, but these reports are a little vague, and if Henry did indeed fire Danny Garcia, apparently it was done a few months ago. This would be a little weird since Garcia is still very much in the conversation when it comes to Henry Cavill. Johnson's gambit would have paid off well if Black Adam had performed the way that he hoped it would have. But as we know, it underperformed at the box office and had a less than great critical and audience reaction. As a quick aside, apparently Johnson had absolutely no interest in doing a cameo in either of the Shazam movies. I find this humorous since Black Adam is a primary villain of Shazam. I also find this funny since, as a pro wrestler, he should know the value in putting somebody over. That's a wrestling term for helping a new guy get over with the crowd. Some will claim that the man who effectively started the DCEU is responsible for killing it. Of course, I'm talking about Zack Snyder. His 2013 film, Man of Steel, was pretty well received by the audiences. And even though it didn't set box office records, it was profitable. What some Superman fan purists at the time didn't appreciate was a darker sensibility to the Man of Tomorrow. A criticism that was popular at the time was that Superman shouldn't be fallible like a man. This was especially true when Supes killed General Zod at the end of the movie. Snyder had doubled down on this darker tone with the release of the 2016 film Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice. We not only had a Superman that wasn't afraid of killing, but also a Batman who had absolutely no issues with unaliving his foes. He was also fond of branding his criminal prey with a bat symbol. Apparently, this all but guaranteed a death sentence in prison from the other inmates. Oh, I had forgotten to mention the miscasting of Jesse Eisenberg as Lex Luthor. I wouldn't really say miscast, just given the wrong creative direction to go down. Eisenberg had already played a chilling Lex Luthor when he starred in the movie The Social Network as Mark Zuckerberg. If Jesse had done something similar with Lex, I think it would have worked out well. All in all, though, the movie wasn't horrible, but it did have a great deal of issues with pacing, tone, and some of the scenes were just clearly a CGI fest. But I will say that scene when Wonder Woman enters the fight against Doomsday, that was pretty cool. Tell me you didn't pop when you saw it. I dare you. Yeah, you did. With both Man of Steel and BVS, Snyder had had a great deal of creative control over the projects. With the blessing of the top management of Warner Brothers Studio at the time, 
This did change after the release of Batman v Superman. From there, the studios went into a sort of damage control mode, and thus far, there really hasn't been a cohesive vision for the studio since then. This changed the plan trilogy to become two movies, and eventually just one, and I'm talking about the Justice League. Also, Zack Snyder left the project after his daughter tragically passed away, and the film was taken over by Avengers director and all-around good boy who totally respects boundaries and women in general. Sarcasm. Of course, I'm talking about Joss Whedon. We did eventually get to see his vision and where he was going with his storytelling in 2021, thanks to HBO Max. In some aspects, I agree that the tone of the Snyderverse was pretty dark, but it's important to remember the context of what was happening during the time period. Around 2011, DC Comics entered a new phase of their comic releases with the new 52. This was another reboot of their continuity with the hopes of getting the attention of new comic readers by resetting all titles back to number one. One thing that was evident in these new titles was a tone that was a little darker than the previous incarnations. This was the environment of DC when Snyder was hired by Warner Brothers Studio. For this time period, Snyder was actually the perfect person for the job. And this makes a lot of sense when you view his works like 300, and especially The Watchmen. When Batman v Superman was released, DC Comics had, again, changed their presentation of their characters with the event of Rebirth. It keeps the characters that worked with the New 52 and reintroduced characters from the previous era. DC Rebirth almost mirrors what DC Film had been attempting with their soft reboot of the franchise after the Flash movie. Was Zack Snyder's Justice League what ultimately ended up changing the characters of Batman and Superman was Hope. They both acted in accordance to Hope, and they became the best versions of themselves by the end of the film. The promise of what could have been is a little heartbreaking when you think about it. The Justice League was supposed to be the first of a trilogy, and it sounded really cool. A revelation that Bruce Wayne had an affair and knocked up Lois Lane, who would eventually die. A distraught Superman turns to Darkseid's evil after Lois's death. The post-apocalyptic Batman teeming with whomever he could find, including a better version of Jared Leto's Joker from The Suicide Squad, to try to right the wrongs of his choices. This would all culminate with Batman sacrificing himself to ensure that Lois Lane survives and Superman doesn't go all injustice on the rest of the Earth. Sad face. In my humble opinion, Walter Hamada had a lot to do with the DCEU downfall. An example of this would be Ray Fisher's experience with the studio during the reshoots of what would be called the Justice League. Ray Fisher had accused Hamada of sabotaging an investigation into misconduct that's alleged to have occurred. Hamada also let personal feelings interfere with his business decisions and ended up greenlighting projects that were less than impressive, like a Wonder Twins movie. Even though Hamada came into the position after the Justice League release, he could have easily made decisions based on fan interest rather than his own ego. Granted, David Zasloff and Safran and Gunn may be the ones who pounded in the death nail for the DCEU, but it was Hamada and other Warner Brothers executives who put DC Film into the position it currently is in. Of course, that's just my opinion, and I would love to hear yours. Feel free to express yourself in the comments section, and if you enjoy my content, please leave a like and a sub if you'd like to see more. As always, fare thee well, my friends, and take care. Cue the music.